of this short talk on strategy and reflection. Specifically aimed at students on the 20 project module Strategy and Continuing Professional Development, which is part of the MSc in Professional Engineering at the University of Derby. It is being offered as the first synchronous seminar of the course, but it will also be available as a video that will then be able to be utilised for an asynchronous seminar and discussions. It attempts to explain why we are departing some of the traditional strategic teaching model, which is about learning how to use various models and applying them and writing reports, etc. And introducing a strong element of reflection in the course and stressing why this is important and why we do so. I think it's very important actually to recognise that this course is, is about continuing professional development, but strategy itself is often about continuing professional development. In fact, strategy away days, strategy events, strategy programmes, etc. within corporations and organisations are often used both to develop strategy but also to build team spirit, to build teams, to build ideas, to, to spread a kind of corporate ethos and morale throughout an organisation. And that's another way to reflect in this. So, to address this first, let's look at what's the first question. And the first question I wanted to ask here really is, what is strategy? And this might seem to be a key question as part of this module. In fact, students on the module are asked at the very beginning to start by writing, what is strategy? So they have a short paragraph which they can refer back to and which actually will be part of their initial reflections later on as well think about what is strategy. Um, and that answers this question often is that strategy is a series of models and theories. These are put together in order to build up a picture of the world around you. And therefore we will always look at a variety of number of models in this area. We will look at things like SWOT, Strengths, Weeks, Opportunities and Threats. It's a very common model, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. PESTEL, an idea of looking at things with politics, economics, society, technology, legal, environmental inspects, the five forces of Porter, and there are many, many others of these as well that we need to think about. And ask ourselves, really, are these models important? Now, of course, they have some other supports, but in reality, what matters is the process of strategies, the getting together, the having discussions. But this has been lost in many management consultants. In many management consultants, it's like the model has taken pride of place. The model is more important than the individual elements of the model. Actually, it's sort of said that the actual idea of the consultant itself comes from the original Anglo Saxon, a combination of the words that mean to con and insult. It's one way of looking at the way that consultants often operate within businesses. And so, if we want to remember something as we go through this course, and if you, any people know they use this law, is to remember this that all the models are wrong, some models are useful. This is generally attributed to the statistician George Box, but it's true of all sorts of that academic theories. It's not so that they're wrong and completely useless, but it is to say, to a certain extent, that there is much wrong with them and they do not represent a true image of the world. Therefore, if you use them to learn and help you develop ideas, they are strong. But if you just follow them wildly and without thought and thinking, they will lead you up the wrong way. In order to do strategy, all you actually need is four things. You need a sense of vision and mission, something what it is you are trying to do. You need to have clear objectives that are signposted along the way towards the culmination of your vision and mission, exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. You need to know yourself, you need to understand what it is that you have, what your powers are, what your resources are, do that. And you need to know your opposition. By your opposition, it doesn't necessarily mean direct opponents. It may well be the society which you operate, it may be the market which you operate, it may be people competing with you. It may be just the general environment in which you operate, and there are people trying to do the same things you, people trying to do different things than you. It can be very, very, you have to think about opposition in a very flexible manner. This work is actually based on the idea of Sun Tzu, circa 550 BC, some strategy writing very old. It's interesting about Sun Tzu, of course, he's often pushed forward by many modern strategists because they, are, they take a very literal interpretation of what he said and they apply it to sort of management consulting books. 
and I'll say Sun Tzu was a great strategist who happened to write in poetry. I take a fundamentally different view of this. I think Sun Tzu was a great poet, and it's because he was a great poet that he was able to be creative and a true strategist. And you see many of the stories about how Sun Tzu demonstrates his brilliance, including his old story in which he he said when he first came to the emperor's court, that I will teach you, I will lead your army properly. And the emperor said, how will you prove this? And he said, oh, I will show you how to train your favorite concubines to march. And he, as good as soldiers, and they were marching, they were giggling and playing about, and he beheaded one of them. And after that, they were all really well behaved. And this is sort of what great strategy is. Actually, if you read work of Sun Tzu, that quite clearly is nothing like the way that Sun Tzu would have operated. It has no relation to anything else that he said. He's completely out of character with him. And when people tell you stories like that, it tells you they are not actually teaching Sun Tzu as the creative strategist. They're teaching Sun Tzu as a kind of model, precursor to today's modern management, etc. So, for this point of view, to avoid that problem, to avoid the idea where you might end up behind your concubine, I'm going to tell you that we, uh, we use an assignment within these sort of modules that is both reflective and critical. For that, we consider that there are two major models of strategy. Model one, Homo Strategicus, neoliberal model-led approach based on economics that uh, develops a the models that you see, you may not realise this, but many of the models that you use and operate under are developed under neoclassical economics, and they do have something to say, things to a lot of truth in neoclassical economics, but they are too often designed very much in the idea of the steps that are taken, and they become controlling, you have to follow this model. But it's also important that you understand the Homer reflectors, and this is why in the assignments you offer two sets. You get a section of the front, which is where you do some Homer reflectors, and you have a section of work in which you then have to reflect on that. So you set the front, you do some Homer strategicus, then a section of the work which you reflect on that, you do some Homer reflectors. So this is about understanding what the uses of Homer strategicus are and why they're important, why you have to know them. But you need to go beyond that. To be a good strategist, you need to be on, go beyond that. Which is why we introduce elements of both in the models and courses that we teach. by Homo Strategicus. Let's be absolutely clear what we mean. Homo Strategicus is the classic example of a strategic leader, the middle class, middle aged, has an MBA, and you'll get the MSc in professional engineering. They're often male, make no excuses for that, we're talking about different that they're often white in the modern society over here, of course we students read this this lecture make a variety of places and we're used to a different type of things, but it's still the same sort of thing. If you actually look at the leadership of China, for instance, certainly not White, but and certainly maybe not have MBAs, but mostly they are professional engineers, often trained in this sort of manner, do the same sort of management training schools, etc. Do that, taught inside Chinese universities, and have been familiar with the sort of production that they are doing over there. They're producing people along along the same line, and they've gone back to for a long time historically China as sort a of professional, educated civil service class and managerial class for a lot longer than many people in the West have, and perhaps for a lot longer than you would have realised. So we have this image of the people like this, this Homo Strategicus. The question is, you go through this thing, you've done all this education, you gain all these skills, but do you actually use them? Do you use the knowledge that you've gained? Do you spend your time when you actually write a strategic report considering Porter's generic strategic models? Do you think about his five forces when you do that? Do you do these on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you look at Minsper? Do you read Minsper's books? Do you have them open? Do you actually have the grant models open? Grant, great writer, but actually is one of the people who criticised many of the MBA situations, point out within the mistakes and failures of the MBA model, then in all likelihood they're probably not reading these books as they go through it. So what is it? Well, in many ways, as the education is important, it's a rite of passage. Are the methods that we are teaching these things effective? Do they work? Do they help you achieve what you're aiming for? How do they stay fresh? If they've learnt a model of strategy 20 years ago, is it still real? Relative. One of the first times that I actually started to think about criticism of strategy and the way it was taught was I did my first strategic courses 20 years ago. And then 10 years ago, I went back from refresh and managed to business schools, but the refresh was basically the same thing. Uh, and I thought it made me concerned a little bit about whether or not my experience the past 10 years has shown me that there were some useful things I'd learned, but there were also things that I'd learned. And I'd, ex I'd expected there to have been changes, and these changes are, as such were not happening in the education system. It's also to recognise that different organisations, different rules. Many years ago, I was working with Siemens in the States at the time of Enron, where the particular group I was working with had severe problems because we'd lost a lot of orders due to the collapse of Enron, who we were actually supplying 
with power stations, we're building power stations, so from California Power and Light, Calpine. Uh, and we had a, well, probably brought consultants in. They came in with a model that had been used to solve GEC's problems. First question after, after listening to the last four hours, I was talking to my professor at Manchester Business School, but do you have the same problems as GEC? No, we don't. But if you use GEC solutions, you'll get yourself into even more trouble than you are at the moment. The reality is if you don't have the same problems as somebody else, then don't use their solutions. This results in a big contradiction in the way we have to teach strategy. On one side, we have the idea that actually, if you want to become a strategist, if you want to get a job in strategy, if you want to get promoted into a position where you do strategy, strategy often seems to be in the role of the senior people in the organisation, then you need to have the knowledge of home strategy because there's no point just sitting there and saying, we criticise strategic models, we criticise the approach to strategy, we criticise this rigid top-down approach. If the people who take that decision then no, do not get an opportunity to go on and implement the better conditions. So we actually require people to learn the better ones. So effectively what we say is to become a good strategist, you must learn and understand the American or the European way, the American way is considered to be kind of the more operational way, the way that uses more operational research, more numbers, more crunching, etc. The European way, which might be more implementation of models and theories and practices, etc. Scenario planning and things like that. But actually, so you must understand these. The best strategists understand both sets of these things and both, both approaches. But to be a good strategist, having become a strategist, you must then to a certain extent reject these models and say, actually, we need to be a much more reflective approach on that. But to get through the door, you must be able to use the models. Therefore, we need to teach you how to use the models. And we need to always keep that balance together. Homo strategicus is often seen as the role model which makes a difference. The role model which will allow people to get through the door and you need something you need to follow. And it's often people look up to it. These are people who look at the idea of these great leaders and captains of industry. These are people who buy their biographies, we watch the, the films on television, we copy them, we look at the documentaries, etc. The, the guides to how to businesses and they become important to us. And it's important to recognise this. this is a real thing. We can't just ignore them, be academics and say, oh no, this doesn't work. We have to use this really much more for, for kind of approach. So what we're saying is don't let home strategists be a role model. Do learn and understand the models. That's why we teach all this on the course. It's important to understand it, but retain the intellectual capacity to use them, not to be used by them, not to be led by them. Don't be the situation where people are shouting, you let the matrix solve the problem because they're saying the matrix gives us this answer. And as we stress this thing, so that all the models are wrong, but some of the models are useful. You need to decide for yourself which models are useful to you, which ones fit with the way you think. That's why there's so many different models around, which will help to guide your process and thinking. So to be a successful strategist, you need to be both homo reflectus, the reflective human, as well as homo strategicus, the strategic human. So you need to be and take on board this idea of being a reflective thinking practitioner. So to a certain extent, we're saying in the assignments, the first part of each assignment is Homo Strategicus. The second part is Homo Reflectus. We're trying to bring them together so you can see how both of them combine to make a good strategist. Effectively, the first assessment report, I've just gone through this, I think we've already gone through this, you've already submitted models of this, but it's a free 2000, up to 2,000 words, and it helps achieve the first learning outcomes and it's quick to analyze the sector of industry, rent to industry, especially the builders. I'm not going to go into this because, like I said, most of you've already submitted copies and done that. So you've not just your own company's approach, but the, across the sector international concept. And that is the Cahoma strategic element of the assignment. That's why there are two parts, A and B. The part is the one that we think we find more complicated, and that is the what is reflective writing. So what we really want you to do is think about what has happened over the length of the course, the experience of the group, the experience of the class. It's particularly in playing the game, applying models, actually being a strategic manager, perhaps, and applying these things. And in many ways, people find this much more difficult, more challenging than other forms of uh, writing. It makes you actually have to be honest, exert its errors. Most people, when they write a report at the end of a the course, they expect to just say what went well. It's a constant problem as well when we ask people to write projects about their own company, because some of them are very, very reluctant to criticise their own country company. And so it often makes it sound like everything was wonderful, everything was perfect. 
there was nothing went wrong, everything that we did was fine, etc. No, but we need to be honest here, we need to understand what didn't work in your group, what did work in your group, what went well, what didn't well. Some reflection may well be about your actual work within your companies as well, and you may have to be honest about the fact that things you might not want to say openly your sound is private between you and the, the market, which we say actually there are problems within companies. There are issues sometimes when we're trying to implement strategic thinking. And it's very important you be able to explore that and understand that. So, you must be open to talking this way and you must be open to criticising and self-criticism. It is suggested that one of the many different reflective cycles that are available gives reflective cycles a strong one that should be considered to be used. It's a fairly simple six-stage process. Start from the idea of looking at what happened, was it a case you read, an incident at work, or possibly part of the game or part of the simulation, decisions were made and assessed with your team. And then look at them, what were you thinking and feeling about at the time? How well did it go? What did it mean to you? Then go on to evaluate it. Just, was it a good experience? Was it a bad experience? Were you able to learn something from it? Like that. And think about the situation. Have you thought about it? Have you really felt about whether you felt it was good or bad since you evaluated it? Can you make sense of the situation? And this should bring you around to make a conclusion as to whether or not you had the right approach, whether or not you felt about how do you think you should use this in the future, etc. Bring you on to the action plan so you can bring together, based on your conclusion, ideals of what you would do if you did it again, what you would do to happen again. And in fact, in context perhaps of the game where you have to make a decision every week, Maybe you'd like to think about how you might do it differently the following week. So how exactly should you write reflectively? Well, start off, set the scene. Let's like start from what was your understanding of strategy to start, use one to write those references to back yourself up. And this is what I had to do at the beginning of the course. Before you learn anything, write down what you think strategy is, because this is about developmental because I want to see if your ideas are changing, if we're starting to make you see some things to be a more creative process, less perhaps of a modular theoretical economic process, less mathematical. And then, having said what you thought it was at the beginning, pick examples from the theories, ideas, models, cases, papers, games, etc., whatever you've done through the course, try and back it up with maybe two or three academic reasons to have discuss. And talk about it. What did these things mean to you? Perfectly describe them. How to use them in the game. How to use them in the case. How to use them in various places. Or maybe why you didn't use them. Why you rejected certain models that were put forward. Describe how it worked. Did it improve your performance? Was it actually helpful? And if you found that it wasn't quite perfect, if you found that the model was maybe wrong in some ways, but was useful, how might you be able to improve it to make it more useful? And then make a conclusion of what would you do differently. What would you do in the future and make a try? strategic choices. How would this influence perhaps either later parts of the course, later parts of the module, but also take it out of this. How do you interest your career? How would you manage to use it when you finish? How would you go on towards your developmental things like, to help you with your personal growth? And these are really important issues that we need to consider as you go forward and these should be part of reflective writing. I want to see words, I want to see diagrams, I want to see pictures. I don't want to see loads of words. I think there are times when actually if you're going to use a theory, use a diagram. But don't just give me the diagram from the book. Don't just give me the diagram from the journal. Annotate them. So for instance, if you use Porter's Five Forces, show the actual activities of the game or the cases, etc. within the diagram. Don't just write what the five forces are in theory. I can look that up in the book. I know that. I want you to actually tell me what you use, what you came out of the diagram. Okay, and many of you will produce excellent slides for your PowerPoints, etc. So you can use these as diagrams inserted into the text. So if you if you're doing a, a presentation, either individually or as a group presentation, you can include in there, put the group name, the date, in the bibliography. In the bibliography, use group name, presentation at University of York, York, date of presentation, etc. Depending on which one they actually are, which one you're doing.
So how do you actually use academic evidence to flip fact? This is a master's level project. I expect to see good evidence of reading, good evidence of academic understanding of what strategy is. So when you analyze individual events, think about what the, the models you use, but also think about what the theory said about how the outcome should have been. If you use a SWOT, did it actually give you the kind of insight that, uh, that is all often argued that SWOTs are supposed to do? If you use a pestle, did it give you the insights that a pestle is supposed to do? Did five forces really reflect the nature of the environment in which you're working? So actually think about this in the, using the academic evidence to back it up and criticize it. To get a distinction, even to get a merit, I expect to see synthesis here and arguments. So are your observations consistent with the theory? Is it actually working? the way that you would expect it to from reading them up on the models, reading the published academic evidence. Can the theories help you to interpret your experience? Maybe they're not exactly right, but maybe there are ways in which you can look at the theories and say, actually, I can understand where they're coming from, even though I don't think they were correct. And this is actually the nature of synthesis. And a very simple way of synthesis is if you're starting to annotate the models by putting your own feelings, your own experience in there, what you actually did. This, I mean, you've got people think synthesis and think, oh, as part of my master's level, writing, I'm supposed to come up with new ideas, that's too hard. Well, actually, it can be as simple as this, annotating the existing model. So be selective in using evidence reflective writing. Look at what was successful, look at what was particularly challenging and reflect deeply on these significant aspects and learning points. I do not want to see you write about 500 words on every week. You must pick out key things over the, the seven or eight weeks that you were learning where f important things happen, maybe three or four of them, which actually show how you use strategy, how you came to understand strategy. So I think it's very important that you look and reflect deeply on a few signaling signal outside. Obviously, you go to depth in a few areas than trying to uh, be too general across the whole course. Discuss your reflection with others. This will help you deepen your insights and improve your ability to express your ideas. It'll help you to explore a range of perspectives. Of course, in the end, you're writing an individual essay. You need to put forward something that is very individual about you, but it's very, very pause or very possible for you to do this. I think it's also important that you look at things that actually where else may we be able to find information from. I really want to see because it's I think it's at the core of becoming a strategist. It's very important that you understand this idea of home strategic and group work, etc. And group thinking, all these kind of things. All these things must be part of your work. All these things must be part of your reflection so that you can become a good, efficient strategist. Because I'll be honest, what I, I believe in strategy, I believe in the importance of strategy. I also believe that many of the models we use for strategy are wrong. I believe that both from experience and also from theory. So I think if we can go forward and make some significant changes to the way we think about this, we can be very, very successful. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so intense, perhaps, about the way I get you to study and get you to learn. So what references should you use? Well, let's just use firstly, academic references, use tech books, use scholarly books, use journal articles. And it's most important that you use journal articles. And the second most important thing is you use a conference proceedings. Books of various types are important, but your majority of your references must be journal articles and or conference proceedings. And secondly, there's online research open from the universities, from research publications, etc. These are also good. There's, the main course, when you're told how many references you should have, etc., in any given essay, then this will be actually be related to 
the number of academic references. The nature of strategy is that you'll also need to produce a lot of non-academic references. And these are maybe to do with like when you're studying the environment, you might look at the BBC website, you might look at other newspaper websites, you might look at the Guardian, for instance, you might use lecture notes, you might use group work and discussion. Like these are all important and these more things must be referenced. And so you might say, well, when we're doing an environmental scan, I went to this website about Africa, I went to this website about China, I went to this website about the European Union, etc. When I was doing my internals audits, I went to these sort of websites. These all need referencing. But when I say to you, I want so many references, what I'm referring to specifically is the number of academic references. Why are we asking you to reflect? We're asking you to reflect because it will strengthen your understanding. We believe it gives you a deeper appreciation of the material. It'll embed it in your memory. Used by, but from memory, it's also used by many professional institutions. So we embed this thing in your memory. You actually get to use it. But many of the professional institutions, when you leave here, you use it to qualify higher levels of membership, fellow or charter. For instance, I'm a fellow of the Higher Education Association. I needed to reflect. I need to write a reflective piece to get that. I'm also an engineer, but I'm not a chartered engineer, but I'm working my chartered status at the moment, and I need to write reflective diaries on skills, etc., that I've learned while doing that. So it's very, very important. And ones that Institute of Engineers definitely uses it, Higher Education Academy uses it, Chartered Management Institute uses it. So all of these are areas in which if you want to progress, you need to do reflection. So they are starting to understand the important reflection outside it is not just an academic skill. It's a skill that will be very useful for you and very important for you going forward in your careers. As I noted in the academics writing, it's unusual to use I or use the first person, but in this sort of reflective writing, you will, will do. However, you also have to recognize that it's also a piece of academic work. So in fact, what people find difficult is that the fact you need to use both first person and the third person. And I don't want to see two completely separate sections. You can get a pass if you have 2,000 words on academia and 1,000 words on reflection, but the reality is the two should be Intimate, intimately linked together, even possibly within the same paragraph. And that is what you want to do if you want to get a merit, if you want to get distinction, if you want to get to get the higher grade, you need to be doing that. Balance it, weave them together, therefore. If you want to get the higher grades, it's much more effective to do it this way. Final tips. Don't just describe what happened, explore and explain what happened. Be honest. In this type of writing, it's okay to admit making mistakes as well as successes. It's okay to say, we did this wrong. We had to learn from this. We're trying to go forward. What you're trying to do is show improvement, showing learning. If you didn't make any mistakes at the beginning of the course, then you can't have learned anything. 
because you haven't learned enough to realize where your mistakes were because you will have made them. Be selective. Don't write about everything. Write about what you can see the key turning points of the next few weeks. And everything must look to the future. How are you going to use this in the future? How are you going to be a strategist in the future? How are you going to think about applying and using strategies? So summary, start with what your thought strategy was. Do not describe the whole course. Pick three or four parts. Theory and practice, synthesize these together. Use references. More diagrams, less words. End not with where you are, but where you are going. This is a learning journey you are documenting. And if you use it correctly, if you learn to reflect, it will help you to develop as an individual, but it will also be important in helping with your career. You should also be looking at how the interaction of the group help. Like I said, in strategy, your ability to work with other people, your ability to convince other people, your ability to lead other people, your ability to take ideas from other people, your ability to work together as a team is key to your success with strategy. So we're not just putting you in a group and saying, oh, well, hopefully the outcome will come of it as you would in normal groups. In this case, we're actually asking, how did the group help? Do you think the diverse things in the background of the group were good or useful? Do you think it would have been easier if they weren't? Although I argue for diversity, I do accept that quite often it is easy to get started. The earlier stage of anything are easier if you have people who think the same way. Do you actually think you'd have been better off alone? Do you think you could have done better without the support of the group? Did you get the group structure right? Did you have to change it any place? If it was up to you, not up to the group now, if it was up to you, what would you have done differently to the group? Did you find problems kept repeating themselves? Was it the fact that they, you think, oh, I've solved this problem this week, but the following week the same arguments would appear, the same problems would appear. Or were you able to, over the weeks, to actually become a better, more functioning organisation? Were you spending too much time in the group? Were you spending too little time in the group? All these are important questions. It's important to be able to balance time. If you understand, you have a limited amount of time. The game is played in a universe in which is, the rationality is bounded. There's only so much you can do. So are you capable of organising the discussions? Are you capable of limiting the discussions? So are you capable of understanding that it's not possible to look at everything? So you have to make the best decision under the circumstances. These are all key parts of functioning as a strategic think tank, which is effectively what you are.